Welcome, Talent Warriors, to another episode of the Talent War Podcast. This is George Randall, and today I have the honor of speaking with somebody who really understands talent at its core. I have with me today Rich Devinney, former or now retired U.S. Navy SEAL and author of The Attributes, 25 Hidden Drivers of Optimal Performance. Truly a groundbreaking book and one that I keep right next to me as I do my work daily. So stand by to learn really what's driving talent. Hey, Rich, it is uh, good to see you again. Good to talk to you. I appreciate you coming on the Talent War podcast because, you know, of all the books I read, as soon as yours came out, I was like absolutely amazed and <laughs> dog earing several pages, enjoying it because I can be a data hound. But uh, for those of our listeners that haven't picked up your book yet, which I hope they do, tell us about your career. How did you figure out that, hey, you know what? I'm going to go be in the Navy and and tell us about your career. Yeah. Well, first of all, it's great to talk to you. I mean, we, you and I have had so many conversations, so I guess we might as well make make one of them official. Right? <laughs> yeah. Here we go. Yeah. I mean, I grew up wanting to be a Navy pilot. My twin brother and I, from the time we were like six or seven years old, wanted to be Navy jet pilots. So that's kind of what our bent was. And it wasn't really until when I was in high school when the first Gulf War happened and I learned about what the Navy SEALs were. And at that point, I was really intrigued. And I was like, who are these guys? I got a lot of books. Almost no one knew who they were back then. <laughs> I mean, so, so I got all the books and read up about it and found myself, ended up going to college at NROTC program and ended up just saying to myself, I didn't want to be a pilot and wonder if I could be a SEAL. So I said, I'm going to try it. So, so that's what I did. I tried it out, got selected to go to SEAL training, which is cool. And then actually got to SEAL training and, and made it through, which was also cool. So so and then started. I mean, that was in '96, and that started, of course, a career that was a little bit slow at first. But of course, post you know after 9/11 happened, everything got very kinetic very quickly. And so it spent 20 years basically retired in 2017. But it was during that career. Obviously, I did many many deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan. But I also ran training for one of our specialized SEAL commands. And during that process was when I really started to get really fascinated with performance, really human performance, and what that actually meant. And again, I mean, when we talk about talent, talent really comes down to performance. That's what it is. And I'm really someone, you know this about me, I just like, I love semantics, and I like getting down to the elemental, you know, bite-sized pieces of things. And so ultimately, if you break down talent, it breaks down into performance. If you break down to performance, it breaks down to attributes and skills. And this is what I kind of discovered while running training, and then got out of the Navy and realized that a lot of organizations weren't they kind of knew this stuff, but they weren't able to articulate effectively what they were thinking. Like, why weren't dream teams working? And why were things becoming toxic? Why were people not performing under stress, challenge, uncertainty? And, and the answer seemed fairly clear to me, and I figured I'd write a book about it. So so I did, and here I am. <laughs> yeah, I got to ask, you know, because we, we've talked on another podcast that we're on to book number two, that masochistic gene has taken on a new life, and we're all deciding to get after it again. You know, Mike Sorelli... When he was asked to go back, and I think he was leading the training for junior SEAL officers, I think that's what he got assigned to. Yeah, I think so. Yep. Yep. He was upset. He was really upset. I mean, and, and we all know Mike. Mike's like, break glass in time of war, send him out. Yeah, he gets upset easily, doesn't he? <laughs> I say that lovingly. He's a good friend. He does. And <laughs> and I love to tweak him in my army way every chance I get. But when you were selected you know, to lead that training... Did you kind of feel similarly or did you see it immediately as an opportunity to go, hey, hey, this is something really unique and interesting to me? Or was it during that training that you kind of thought, wow, OK, now I get to dig in and I'm seeing things I hadn't really put my head around before? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I don't think I got upset. I mean, the reason why upset and again, I tease Mike, his temperature rises and falls quickly, but he's also very good at problem solving. So he doesn't let his temperature affect his ability to problem solve. And that's, in effect, what being upset and angry sometimes does. High emotion doesn't really put us in a good conscious state to solve problems. When I got to be in charge of the training that I was running, one of the problems we were facing was that we were, again, for this command, we were getting some of the best, so the top candidates from the other spec ops teams, and they're coming to our command, and then they're going through our own selection process, and we're getting about a 50% attrition rate, which is okay. I mean, that's what every selection process is supposed to do. The problem was we weren't 
effectively articulating why guys weren't making it through. And they were, we tended to lean on things like, well, I couldn't shoot very well, couldn't jump very well, couldn't do these things. And I said, well, it's not really about these things, is it? Because these guys are all experienced dudes. So they've already done these things several hundred times. So it's not really that a guy can't shoot. It has to be more, which is really when I kind of thought about basic SEAL training. And, and I mean, you could say the same thing about basic army boot camp or marine boot camp or anything like that. But certainly SEAL training, you spend hundreds of hours running around with heavy boats on your head and hundreds of hours running around with and exercising with 300 pound telephone poles. And when I kind of reflected, I said, you know, I've done literally hundreds of combat missions overseas in Iraq, Afghanistan and other places. Never on one did I carry a boat on my head or a <laughs> telephone pole on my shoulder. And so what that tells us is when you call it SEAL training, it's actually a misnomer. It's not training at all. They're not training you to be Navy SEAL when, when they make you do those things. They're throwing you into situations, into environments, into an experience that teases out these hidden qualities called attributes, these innate things that we're trying to figure out that are hidden and, and not really in the forefront to see if you have what it takes to do the job, right? So, so this is where I began to have to make a distinction between skills and attributes. And then, of course, in writing the book, was able to kind of really dial into that distinction in so far as what a skill is and what an attribute is. Was it hard for you when you're in training? Because the specialized folks that were coming to you, I would imagine by the time they're getting to you, there's zero quit in these people. Oh, yeah. It's not about quitting at all. Yeah. And so this is a real big difference because something I used to say, if you think about regular SEAL training, and that's BUDS, Basic Underwater Demolition Slash SEAL Training, right? designed originally by Draper Kaufman in the 40s to predecessors to the UDT Naval Combat Demolition Units, your primary job in SEAL training is not to quit. That's the primary job. It's not really about performance. I mean, you learn some basic skills in BUDS, but it's basic diving, it's basic shooting. And unless you're a real just, I mean, <laughs> I don't know what to say, but I don't want to throw too many derogatory. Unless you're really just not sharp at all. I mean, you are, it's very easy to do what they're telling you to do from a skills perspective. It's only after you get out of buds that you start to learn like really in-depth skills. So your primary job is not to quit. The training we were running was completely different. The primary job in that training was to perform. You had to perform. And this is why it was so easy to place value and judgment upon the skills factor, because oftentimes we think of performance just as skills, but it's more than just skills. And so I guess it'd probably be good for me to break these two things down, right? The skills are not inherent to our nature. None of us are born with the ability to throw a ball or ride a bike or shoot a gun, okay? We learn how to do those things. We train how to do these. We're taught or can teach those things. Skills direct our behavior in known and specific environments. Here's how and when to drive a car, ride a bike, shoot a gun. And because they are kind of visible and didactic, they're very easy to see, and they're very easy to assess, measure, and test. You can score them. You can put stats around them. You can put them on a resume, okay? In a hiring process, you can know someone can say, oh, you sold this many things, widgets or whatever. The problem with skills is the skills don't tell us what we do and how we show up in times of uncertainty, challenge, and stress, when things become unknown. Because when the environment is unknown, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to apply a known skill. This is when we lean on our attributes, okay? Attributes are inherent to our nature. We're all born with levels of adaptability, situation awareness, patience, perseverance, okay? Now, certainly, they develop over time and experience, okay? Uh, they can be developed, but you can see levels of this stuff in small children. The, the other thing about attributes is they don't dictate behavior or direct behavior. They inform behavior, right? So my sons, I always you know, use the example, my son's levels of perseverance and resilience inform the way he showed up when he was learning the skill of riding a bike. He was falling off a dozen times doing so, right? So they inform our behavior. And then because they're hidden in the background and they're difficult to see, they're very hard to assess, measure, and test and almost impossible to score. You can't sit across at the table on an interview and, and, and score someone's patience or adaptability, right? You can't. It's hard to assess. They are, even though they're running in the background in everything we do, they are the most visible and visceral during times of uncertainty, challenge, and stress. When skills can't be applied, that's when they show up, which was what made the laboratory I had so perfect because everything about what we do is throwing people into challenge, uncertainty, and stress. So. When you were in that environment, you know, I would imagine, you know, as you're looking at attrition rate and why people are attriting and you're starting to think of, you know, okay, it's not skills, it's attributes. And is there any part of that? Because I was just curious after I've read the book, is any part of that the speed of thinking, the speed of decision making? How are you even able to measure that? How did you lean into that and say, okay, we've got to be able to measure these in some relatively dependable way? It's a great question. And the answer is absolutely yes. In fact, I would say that in that specific training, the most distinctive 
difference between the guys who made it through and the guys who didn't was what I in the, what in the book I describe as the mental acuity attributes. Yeah. The speed which someone can process and think. The way and the only way we could measure that was experientially, right? So in our specific case, for example, we use close quarter combat, which again, you know, I know most of the audience is familiar with military operations, but close quarter combat, the it's the act of going into a building and clearing a building room by room, right? Whether you're looking for a bad guy or you're rescuing hostages or whatever it is. It's a very, we see it on, the, on TV all the time, but it's a very fast, dynamic and dangerous, quick thinking environment. And the more time sensitive the task when you're going in and clearing something like that, the more precise and dynamic and fast thinking you have to be, right? So for example, if you're going into rescue hostages, okay, you need to be able to run into a room with three or four other guys and within milliseconds, assess your piece of the room, assess who's the bad guy, who's the good guy, and immediately take a lethal well-positioned, well-aimed shot on a target that may be the size of a, a grapefruit, right? I mean, and maybe we'll hit that. And then once that's done, move to another one and do it again until that room is clear. And then immediately assess the next level of threat, i.e. the next doorway or entryway, and move to the next thing. And it's a very rapid way of thinking and moving and very dynamic. When it's done correctly, it's actually quite beautiful to watch. It's like watching a, a, a flock of birds or a school of fish. I mean, it's, it's just a flow to it. But that level of complexity requires a very, very heightened amount of each of the mental acuity attributes, the the situational awareness, the compartmentalization, and the task switching. And I think learnability as well, because you have to process and learn things pretty fast if you, that's certainly what we're asking you to do. But what we have to understand about that is that even though we were using that environment to tease out tease out those attributes and, and see if they had the levels that we were looking for, those same levels of those attributes now apply to many different contexts in the job that we were conducting, right? So think about it. The fact that now I can, I can perform in that environment at that level with that level of mental thinking, now I can also do the same thing if I'm 20,000 feet up in the middle of the night and my parachute malfunctions, right? So I can apply that level of decision-making, rapid thinking, rapid situation. I can do the same thing if I'm diving in the pitch black ocean or in a harbor and something goes wrong, right? So these environments were telling us things about the candidates and ourselves, because we all went through the same selection, <laughs> that applied across the contexts of our job. And this is the power of attributes. And this is what employers have to understand is that if you understand the attributes you're looking for and you look for them and the candidates you're looking for have those attributes, you can always train the skill, okay? We always, we always used to say, we can always train someone how to shoot. I mean, that's easy, you know? Can we train someone to run into a room and within a millisecond decide who's bad, who's good, and make it and take a precise shot and then move on? That's attributes. That start, starts to involve patience, situational awareness, compartmentalization, courage, adaptability, things like that. So, so if you focus on these elemental things, you dive down into performance, you start, what we started finding is, A, we could articulate it better, but we started finding the dark horses. In other words, the guys who didn't appear on the surface level to be very skilled but they had every single attribute we were looking for. And all we needed to do was say, okay, you got what it takes. Now we're just going to spend a little extra time to train you and you will be one of the best we've ever seen. Interesting question. And this is kind of, I don't know, chicken or egg in, in the way that I do this podcast. But I've taught talent acquisition groups that you should be looking for character. You should be looking for the attributes, the skills we can train. There are some table stakes, obviously. Yes, of course. Nobody got to where you were evaluating them if they had not gone through a number of gates, a, a number of assessment cycles before that. That involves skills. Yes, absolutely. There's some gates there. What's interesting, and I may be asking this a little too early, but it's one thing to say, okay, this is what we're looking for in an attribute. It's an entirely different thing, and I want to know how it is for you, to get five other evaluators or cadre to subjectively evaluate that. Meaning once I get five or six people that are interviewing executives, as an example, mm -hmm. and even if I go through the attributes, if I've created a success profile that says these are the attributes that we need for this role, they're all looking at those attributes differently or scoring them differently. And so uh, that's why I'm saying this is a little bit before we talk about all the attributes, but it had to have been a shift in how you evaluated as well, not only what you were looking for, but how you evaluated. What was that like for you all? And you're right. And this is the power of doing it across several different contexts and over the course of nine months, which most hiring process don't have, right? We'd always kind of say, I mean, CQC was quite a good crucible inside of which we could measure a lot of this stuff. But 
if someone was on the edge, right, then we'd say, well, we'll keep them around and we'll see how they do in other contexts, right? I mean, our selection process was nine months and there were people who sometimes we had to deselect in month eight and a half, right? So, which is never a good feeling, but that's how it went because it took some of these attributes to take time and context to see in different environments. So let's take a simple one, conscientiousness, okay, which is a team ability attribute. And it's an attribute that combines three kind of more elemental attributes of diligence, reliability, and working hard. Okay, those three things combine to conscientiousness. All right, well, I can't necessarily measure someone's conscientiousness in a two-week close quarter combat course. I have to let that person kind of marinate in an environment, in several environments, and I have to also get peer reviews because that person might be showing up in a way in front of the cadre that they're not showing up in front of the other students. Like someone could be portraying, this person's always on time and always a hard worker, right? Because the cadre is looking, but as soon as the cadre is not looking, that person's just, you know, gaffing off or doing whatever. And so, or out in town, are they idiots, you know, out in town and, and not humble? Is Does humility and integrity cross the boundary of work to social? <laughs> you know, cadre isn't always going to be there to see that. It's going to be their peers who see that. So peer evaluations helped with this. However, you know, again, we're talking about an environment that was very complex and very high stakes. You know, in most business environments aren't that way and don't need to have a selection process that intense, I would say certainly don't just do an interview, but that, you know, try to do a couple different things, like maybe an interview, maybe a social event, maybe a team, a team event, so you can kind of assess things like that. But just don't make it one interview and then you're done, right? But you're not going to get everything you're looking for if it's that short. Yeah, I would work with executives and we would have five or six key executives you know, how we would map it out is, okay, if we're hiring for an executive role, who are the five or six people either responsible to, are their customers, their internal clients, where they're going to have the most intersection overall? And those people would interview, but then there's executive levels. There's so many more people. And so we create social events. We would create interactions, them sit in on briefings, them contribute to briefings, contribute to presentations. So you would get to see them. Got to be pretty good at picking executives. Yeah. So I want to just jump ahead a little bit. So for writing the talent war, how special operations and great organizations went on talent, of which you were a major contributor, you know, I always knew that I had a book in me, but there's so many books written on hiring. And I was just like, you know, I don't want to crack the market. And there's so many books written on special operations. So Mike had that going on in his head. Right. And then, of course, Jordan is forcing him, so he says, to watch Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. And he takes a break and calls me and says, hey, man, we need to write a book. So that was kind of the moment where we brought both worlds together. How did that come about for you to write such a great book? Well, first of all, thank you for, for the compliment. It was a very interesting one. I mean, I, you know, I always loved writing. I didn't know if I had a book in me. So I was kind of I got out of the Navy and I was I didn't really think about it much. You were the one Navy SEAL who didn't think they had a book in them. That's what you're claiming. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I didn't, at least immediately, right? Sorry, that was just a little bit of Army interjecting there. <laughs> well, no, it's true, though, but I was never interested in writing a Navy SEAL book, right? I wanted to write something that was different, but I wasn't really thinking about it much. I befriended, I, I got to meet and, and we became good friends with a, with a guy out in Stanford. He's a neuroscientist. His name is Andrew Huberman. Pretty good dude. Oh, well, very good dude. Very popular now. He has a podcast that's doing very well. And he and I began to work on some stuff together that was a, around this idea of performing through challenge, uncertainty, and stress. And so this is a little bit of a longer story, but we decided, hey, let's write a book on this. So we started putting together a proposal. We went and got an agent and um, started looking at auctioning it out and stuff. And at that time, he had, Andrew had another book. He was also doing a solo project. And what we realized is that whenever you, and you know this from the book world, if you were working on a book or if you have a book, you typically can't write another book until a year after you publish the book you're working on. That's typically a rule, right? So we didn't, neither of us knew that we were new to the game. So we're like, oh, shoot, okay. We're not going to be able to do a joint book just now. And I was like, well, okay, I don't really want to wait too long. And, and Andrew basically said, hey, why don't you write a solo book? You know, you have a ton of stuff. And I was like, okay, well, and my agent said, hey, you should write a solo book. What do you think you could write about? And I shit you not, I basically put together a two-page outline on high-performing teams. Okay, In that outline, I had like, I don't know, 15 or 20 different concepts around what makes up a high-performing team. And underneath a bullet point of one of the concepts was this thing, attributes and skills. And I remember showing that to my agent. She said, well, you have like 20 books here. If you were to pick one thing <laughs> in this thing, if you were to pick one thing that you think you could write about, what would it be? And so I was like, well, probably this attribute skill stuff, right? That's probably what I should, because uh, I had been thinking about it, you know, as I said, because I've been talking to organizations. And so literally out of one bullet line came 
this idea for the book. And I was able to kind of rethink about the things I did in the Navy and dust off some old notes and say, okay, well, let me just explore this. And, and so I just started to explore it and it really started to come together in a, in a fun way. So, so yeah, it was a cool process. How long did it take you from that outline to final edits? I'm always curious. Yeah, it's not too long. I basically, my editor had said, we recommend you work with a writer on this because I'd never written a book. So I didn't know how to put one who can at least help you put it together. And I said, sure. So I linked up with this awesome writer. His name is Sean Flynn and he's near where I live. So I went down to see him. I said, listen, I, I really want to write this book myself, but I need help with you know, kind of organizing structure and things like that. And he said, he said, no, no problem. So we began to generate this system where I would write a chapter and then send it to him and he'd be like, okay, this is cool. One of the things he taught me the most about is just organization of content, right? Here's a good example. The way I typically would write was I do like a nice, cool story and then I'd have content, you know, explaining all the story. He said, well, watch this. And he started breaking up everything. So you'd have a little bit of story, then a little content, a little story, and then content. And what happens when you do that is it flows much better. The book flows much better. So he taught me a lot about that type of flow. But really, it took me about three months. When we talked, we kind of said, hey, the first three chapters are going to be the longest ones to write because you have to set it up. Everything has to be set up properly. Because after that, my plan was just to write a chapter per attribute, right? Which is kind of how the book is laid out. So I think we started in, I'd say, late September of 2019. We had uh, the three chapters, first three chapters were done by the holidays. And then come New Year 2020 in January, we knocked out, I mean, it only took another month and a half to knock out the rest of the book, you know, basically two months, because I was turning in the first draft of the manuscript by the end of February, just the beginning of March, just as we were going into quarantine, <laughs> as the world was going into quarantine was when I was turning in that first. And then after that, it was a couple of months of edits. And the edits, I wouldn't even say my editor was so awesome. He was just like, you know, because I thought he was like, hey, we should shoot for about 55,000 word book and things like that. I think the first draft was like 60,000 words. So I was thinking he was going to make me cut out a bunch. But instead, he's like, actually, this is great. I think we actually need to add some stuff. Let's add, you know, a couple things. And, and so we added some. So I think it ended up around 65,000 words or something. But I found the process highly enjoyable. I had to get into a routine. And the routine was typically I'd get up at four in the morning which I don't like to do. I'm good in the morning, but I don't like to rise really early, but I did it in this case. I'd get up at four in the morning. I'd basically spend first two or three hours just knocking out maybe 1,500 to a couple thousand words because that's really when creativity was flowing. And then I'd spend the rest of the day or two editing what I'd written, getting it to where I really wanted it. And then I'd send it to Sean and Sean would start working on it. And then the next day I'd start the new one, right? And we just kind of got into a rhythm that way. So it started moving pretty quickly. Yeah, Mike and I had a good rhythm. I mean, once, you know, Kelsey, who's helping us with our book now, was able to decipher Mike's crayon writing, you know, we were off and running. You know, we were back and forth and we got into that rhythm. But just a little bit before we get into the actual attributes, and I am cognizant of time, was there any point where you thought you were boiling the ocean? That's a big topic. Well, yes. And I deliberately stopped. So one of the things I really thought I wanted to do, I guess I still would love to do, I just realized it would take too long, was I wanted to write about how the attributes interplay with each other. And what I realized was that, man, that would be a, like a thousand pages <laughs> of just that. So so I had to make a decision just to keep it simple and um, and straightforward. And, you know, when I first started writing at the outset, I actually had like 33 attributes, I think. Yeah, 33 or so, 33 or 36 attributes. And then as I started writing and like looking at them, I started saying, okay, wait a second, these aren't making sense. I need to bin these. This one can go. All right, actually, I should pull this one in and take this one out because it's more, it's less seal, sealish, right? I want it to be more ubiquitous to everybody. And, and so that process was a process that happened throughout. So what did you come down to? So it's 25, right? 25, yeah, 25 attributes, five categories that make up 22 of them. And then there's three, what I call outliers or the others. And the reason why they are the others is because it's actually, I say three, it's actually six because, so bottom line is I found that all the 22 I wrote about in general terms, okay, to have more was better. I say that in general terms, right? So in other words, courage, adaptability, resiliency, in general, to have more is better. You can make the argument with narcissism to have a balanced level is fine. But anyway, that was the general. What I found with these other ones was that if I looked at the polarities, then the polarities were were just as positive. So patience, for example. Patience was one of the attributes I wanted to write about. But when I started thinking about patience, I said, wait a second. When it comes to optimal performance and people who do very, very well, there are patient people who do very, very well, and there are impatient people who do very, very well. It's not an if or then thing or this or that. So both sides actually work. Same with competitiveness and non-competitiveness. 
And then same with fear of rejection versus insouciance to what people think. I don't care what other people think. Those three, both sides of the coin, kind of think like that seesaw, both had massive advantages. So it didn't matter, in other words, which side of the coin you were. It just mattered that you knew which side you were. So that's why those became kind of those three other ones that I talk about. So but 25 total, 22 that are separated into five categories. Five categories are the ones that make up grit, ones that make up mental acuity, the attributes that make up drive, the attributes that make up great leadership, and the attributes that make up great um, team of ability to work on teams. So I want to go into those, but I wanted to pay you a compliment. And I wanted to clarify something for the readers. Obviously, it was written by you, so I wanted to read the book. And I had heard so much about it, and and Mike talked about it. And so I was thinking, okay, this is really going to help me with my assessment game and my coaching and to coach other teams. And I wanted to make sure that I share with the listeners that, yeah, it's going to do all that. But there was the huge introspection part that I walked away with where I was just like, okay, wait a minute, before I start looking externally, And talking about this, I need to look at this book was very helpful for me on a very personal level, not just externally to the clients that I work with. So those people, you know, if you haven't read this book, it's phenomenal, both even if you're not teaching or coaching others just for yourself. So let's go through the first category. Yeah. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you for that. That was always my endeavor to write a book that was about the reader first. Oh, you hit it. And and what's interesting is it caused me to introspect just while writing it. (laughs) I was like, I did a lot of introspection while, while writing it. So let's see, grit. Okay, so what are the attributes that make up grit? A lot of people think of grit as its own attribute, but it's not. Grit is actually a combination of things blended and and boiled and stewed and baked together that become it, right? So in other words, the result of this combination of attributes is grit, okay? Grit is your ability to power through challenge and kind of push through, kind of usually having to do with more acute kind of near-term challenges and obstacles, but uh, that's kind of what it is. And so the attributes that make up grit are courage, perseverance, adaptability, and resiliency. Those combine into someone's being able to be gritty. Mental acuity, which we kind of reference, mental acuity attributes are the ones that kind of describe how our brain processes the world. Okay, so situation awareness, how we how much information we take in. So we can ca- kind of call that vigilance, okay? The person with high situational awareness notices a lot of things. The person with low situational awareness doesn't notice a lot of things, right? This is a, obviously an attribute that most Navy SEALs and special operators have is high situational awareness. I'm the guy who walks down city streets and I, I'm looking at people's hands. I'm looking at dark alleys. I'm noticing cars. I'm noticing traffic lights, right? Things don't necessarily get by me very easily. Then there's compartmentalization. Once we have that information, what are we doing with it based on the current activity we're engaged in? In other words, how are we assessing the information that's coming in? What is it? Prioritizing what makes sense in what order and what in the context of what I need to complete in this moment. And then focusing on what I need to focus on. That's compartmentalization. The ability to kind of do that fairly seamlessly and rapidly is a a measure of high compartmentalization. And task switching, how can I effectively switch between focus points? Okay, this is, again, we can't multitask. That's a myth. We all know that. So what we do is we switch between focus points. That's task switching, right? We're going from driving our car to suddenly walking in the parking lot to suddenly in the grocery store, whatever it is. And then learnability. How fast are we able to learn and absorb and metabolize those lessons that we're learning? Now, sometimes, you know, some people are higher on learnability. The people who are higher on learnability are the people who you may know, or you might be one of these people that you tell that person how to do something once and they got it. I mean, all it takes is one time, right? There are others who are low on learnability, like myself. I make the same mistake a lot. You know, I have to be told something a lot before it actually seeps in, you know, but I know that about myself. Unless my wife tells me. (laughs) (laughs) Well, unfortunately, even when my wife tells me sometimes, but uh, yeah, so if you know that about yourself and and I know that about myself, I know I have to work a little harder, you know, and sure, it pisses me off. Like when I was in SEAL training or my own SEAL selection for this command, I mean, I remember after the days were over, I'd go back to like the shoot house and like think and visualize about what happened in the day. I try to absorb it and, and visualize what I needed to do or where I got things wrong. Or got... There are other guys who just went into drinking because they had it. They didn't have to think about it at all, right? Because they're just high on learnability. All right, then there's the drive attributes. The drive attributes, so whereas grit speaks to kind of the acute short-term challenge, drive speaks to our ability to set, pursue, and achieve long-term goals, okay? What are those attributes that make up the driven person? And those attributes are self-efficacy, open-mindedness, discipline, cunning, and narcissism. And I know there's a couple kind of ones that seem pejorative, but we can get into those if we want to or if we have time. So, But those are the attributes that make up the driven person, okay? Then the attributes that make up great leadership, and we've had this conversation many times, right? Being a leader and being in charge is not the same thing. One is a verb, one is a noun, okay? Leadership is a behavior. 
And I always say, I got a joke, you don't get to self-designate. You don't get to call yourself a leader. That's like calling yourself good looking or funny. Other people <laughs> decide whether or not you are someone they want to follow. You can certainly call yourself in charge, right? I am in charge. So yeah, positionally, that might be true. But whether or not you're a leader is dependent on other people and whether or not they decide to designate you or follow you or designate you a leader or follow you. So that's done based on the way you behave. Those behaviors stem from attributes. Those attributes are empathy, selflessness, authenticity, decisiveness, and accountability. Those five things are most often those behaviors that cause us to say, hey, I consider this person a leader, okay? Then there's team ability, the final category. So our ability to operate and move and behave with other people inside of a team. Um, and again, you don't get to call yourself a great teammate either, right? Other people call you, <laughs> call you, designate you, and they do so based on the way you behave. Those behaviors stem from the attributes of integrity, humility, conscientiousness, and humor. Those four things speak to the behaviors that allow someone to say, this person's a good teammate. You know, I would think anybody who spent any time in the military has to have a sense of humor, especially if you've spent 20 years. I would imagine, although, yeah, most people do. I mean, if you spent 20 years and come out of it okay, yeah, there are certainly people I've met who have very little sense of humor, and you can see in their faces, and you can see it in the age lines, and you can see it in their stress level. So, but yeah, most people, I would say. I wanted to ask you something about, because I know that you coach a lot of people and you speak a lot. And I was just out in, I won't say where I was because I know that these people are going to be listening to the podcast, but I brought up that point, the verb and the noun versus, and because this gentleman told me as we were meeting to figure out whether we were going to work together, he says, well, I am the leader. And I said, well, who told you that? And he was stumped by the question. And I said, well, you do understand or can you understand that you don't get to pick that? That is the people around you that, you know, that are in your organization. He says, well, I've never thought of it that way. Right. Most people don't. Do you run into clients that are very much the same way? And when you're sharing that with them, how do they respond? Because I've had some very visceral reactions, oddly enough. And, and maybe that speaks to narcissism and that speaks to ego. It speaks to a number of things. But for you and I, when you brought that up and we were discussing and we were talking about the second book, I'm like, well, yeah, geez, that's just almost a no brainer. It's so evident. I feel bad that I missed it. Yeah. So I get mixed reactions. Oftentimes, if people are upset by it, it's because consider leadership a position, right? That's, and that's usually a mistake. But again, think about leadership as a position, as a noun, okay? It means to be in front, right? And we describe it all the time, like the leader of the race, the leader of the pack, right? That's the person who is in front of everybody, okay? We've heard all the, all the stories and the mythology around the great leader who says, come on, follow me. Never ask your people to do something you wouldn't do yourself. You know, lead from the front. Leaders always go first, right? Okay, these are not actually true. <laughs> I'm just going to, and I'm going to say this as someone who led some very elite units in the field. I was the guy in charge, so I was technically, by all accounts of normal, I guess, verbiage, the quote leader. But I wasn't always in front. I wasn't always asking people to do something. I would never ask to think that I would ask my sniper to do something that only I had done myself, right, is insane. My snipers could do things that I couldn't even dream of doing because they were so good at what they do. So we got to break some of these paradigms, okay? Oftentimes, and we know this intuitively, that the best leaders are not in front at all. The best leaders are actually behind and they're pushing and they're inspiring and they're causing an environment where people understand when to step up and take charge, when to follow. They're creating leaders. They're building leaders. They're, I always told my JOs, hey, the irony of leadership is if you do your job right, you eventually work yourself out of a job, right? Because you create an environment of people who can run without you and hopefully outpace you. I mean, I used to get excited when I saw junior officers who were coming in behind me and they, I was just like, oh my gosh, these guys are so much better than me. I mean, they are like 10 times better than me. And I used to get excited about that because I knew that eventually they would take my place and they'd outpace me. I would be left behind as I should be as a leader, I guess in that in the military moment. I know I'm being a little bit dramatic here because because you can also promote up and get into bigger, bigger positions of being in charge. But I mean, if you even think about the true blue, like CEO of a company, right? The finest CEOs, they are not in the day-to-day -day no. management and leader. No, they're envisioning stuff. They're kind of thinking through directions. They're liaisoning with people. They're going down, they're shaking hands, they're connecting, right? It's not at all, I'm in charge type behavior, right? So your goal, I think, as an upcoming 
leader or person in charge is to eventually reach, if you want to reach the highest level, you're not going to be doing, you're not going to have to worry about, quote, telling people what to do. And leaders don't tell people what to do most of the time. I mean, I guess there's certain cases where they can, where it's applicable, but most of the time you want to create environments where people know how to solve problems themselves. They can make decisions themselves. They can run themselves. And that's when you really get a high performing team, by the way. Yeah, I have. And that same client that I was talking with, I had borrowed the term and, you know, I had introduced all the people that I had the good privilege to work with you among them that ideally you're trying to work yourself out of a job. And in his particular case, I was tying it to he's so in the weeds. He so wants to be the expert, wants to be directing, like almost literally directing, saying, you know, when there's action, when to cut, cut the scene, add the scene. Right. Right, right. And I told him, I said, you need to work yourself out of a job. And he just had this, you could just see him clench up. Like he was waiting for the argument to come out because I knew where he was going to go. I said, well, let me ask you this strange question. As you're spending all this time doing this, what is it taking away from that you feel like you should be doing as the visionary of this firm? And that saved me, frankly, an ass chewing from a client I hadn't booked yet. <laughs> it really did. That's right. Because I know we're getting a little bit close to time and I, you know, that I always try to keep these short. I want them to be impactful. And this one has. I want to go to two or three simple questions. One, when you're talking with executives and we're talking with leaders and you're talking about this legacy of leadership, building other leaders. Yes. Are there any of the attributes? from a leadership perspective, that you stress more than others? That may be asking you to pick your favorite child kind of thing, which I wouldn't do. Well, it's almost not... Might not even be accurate, yeah. The better analogy would be like asking who the most important player is on a football team. Yeah, exactly. It's impossible to say. It really depends on what you're doing on that field at that time, right? That shifts, right? So so I would say, I mean, the leadership attributes that I talk about, again, empathy, selflessness, authenticity decisiveness and accountability, all five of those are very important and they're important to interplay inside of a leadership arena, right? We just got done saying that we want to, as leaders, encourage and inspire people to make decisions themselves and solve problems themselves. Yet decisiveness is one of the attributes. And that's because sometimes people are looking to a leader to be decisive, right? To make a decision, right? So sometimes the job is to step up and decide, right? Now, decisions, when they're made, the best leaders they make them and they are final, but they may not be permanent, right? And that's really distinctive uh, in terms of semantics there, okay? You make a decision, hey, it's final. We are moving out on this, okay? That's what we're doing. And you move out, right? And as you move out, you begin to assess and see how things are going and see if things are going the right direction. Because you may find, actually, no, that wasn't necessarily the right decision. We actually need to change course, change path, do something. And so it's not permanent. You just change. You make a new decision. So I would say, yeah, these leadership attributes, I don't know if there's one that's more important than the other because it really is quite contextual. And leadership, when you're dealing with human beings, it's a very dynamic, complex relationship. In some cases, you may need to be decisive. And in some places, you need to be empathetic. In some places, you need to be like very candorous, right? Hey, I need to tell you the hard truth. And this is not going to, it's not going to feel good, but I'm telling you these truths because I care about you and I care about this team. Okay. That doesn't feel very empathetic sometimes, right? So it, this is the job of leadership. That's why leadership, no one said it was easy. It's very easy to be in charge, by the way, because someone can just put you in charge. <laughs> yeah. You are in charge, right? Remember when we were in uh, grade school? <laughs> hey, Timmy, you're in charge of the room while I'm gone, right? I mean, well, that part's easy, but the actual work of leadership is difficult. And that's why not many people do it well. So on that note, and this may this may be hard to boil down, but it's a thing that I try to ask. This is one question and the last question. I'm going to give them both to you, and you can answer in either order. So as we close out, what are the top three tips for leaders from you that you would give or that you have gotten either way? And then the last question is, if you could go back to... 21-year-old Rich, what would you tell him that would make your career more impactful, better, easier? And I don't mean mistake or failure free, just right. what advice that as you've accomplished so many things that you would go back and say, hey, these preconceived notions get out of your head. These are things that you could charge forward on faster or whatever. So either question first as a closeout. 
Okay, I'll take the first question first, the three things. And first thing is simple. We've said it many times. I'll just say it again. Leadership is a behavior, not a position. Okay, it's just a truism. You can't get around that. The second one I would say is that one of the most important, impactful things you can say to the people in your span of care is, I need you. Okay, and you can say it explicitly or you can say it in action. Hopefully you're saying it in both ways, right? I need you. I cannot do this without you. You are providing a position, a job, a service, a skill, an attribute that I do not have and this team needs, okay? This is a deference of power. This is a humble leader, a humble position, and it's absolutely necessary. People will need to know that they are valued, need to know that they are part and an important part of a team, a job, a mission. Real quick anecdote in terms of this type of understanding. If you do it correctly and you have a, you have a purpose that's executed and articulated correctly and everybody finds value in what they do. And you know the story, so but I'll, I'll say it anyway, but it was in the 60s after Kennedy uh, declared we were going to the moon, right? And a couple of years later, he was at NASA, touring NASA, and he was meeting different people, finding out what people did. He was walking through the hallway, he bumps into a janitor who has a mop and the president introduces himself, say, what do you do here? And the janitor looks at him and says, what do you mean, Mr. President? I'm trying to get a man to the moon. Yeah. This was the janitor told him, right? Because the janitor knew that what he did had value and what he did was part of a larger, bigger picture. So so that's how much it means, okay? And then the third one is, I would say this, is that there's a lot of stuff out there around self-care. Some of it can get a little woo-woo and I know leaders can sometimes, especially kind of hardcore leaders can be like, hey, I don't need to care about myself, I need to care about my company. But I will tell you this, when it comes to self-care, when it comes to stress, when it comes to challenge, uncertainty, all that stuff, we all know, especially for parents, we all know that, that fear, anxiety, and kind of those negative emotions are contagious. Okay, we know this because if we do it, we see our kids do it, right? Well, guess what's also contagious? Calm. Calm is contagious. Okay. What was the saying I heard just the other day? It was, I think it's an old, I don't know what, maybe an Irish saying, but calm seas don't make great sailors, right? Or never a great sailor make, right? But calm sailors do. I added on the end, calm sailors actually make great sailors, right? So, so even though the seas aren't calm, if a leader is, if a leader knows how to handle themselves in stress, challenge uncertainty, and keeps, maintains calm, maintains collectiveness and coolness, that will be contagious. So those three things. And then the second part, I always find this an interesting question. I'm going to dodge it to a certain extent. <laughs> okay. And the reason why I'll dodge it is because I'll say, and I'll just tell a story. So I went through BUDS class 210. Every BUDS class is numbered, right? And so and you never forget your number. That's actually the, the first sign of a fake seal is that they don't tell you the right buds number or they forget it, right? So you always remember your buds class number. I was class 210. It takes about 17 years or so, 17 or 18 years to go through 100 classes, okay? So if you're lucky enough, you're still around, uh, you might be still active duty when your centennial class goes through. So, so class 310 was going through hell week, going through buds and going through hell week. And I was in San Diego. I happened to be there for some business. And I went and observed their Hell Week, and I got to help secure them from Hell Week, which is a kind of a big deal traditionally. And I remember standing in front of them as they were getting ready. They just finished six days of misery, right? And they're standing there getting ready to be secured. And I stood in front of them, and I said to them, I said, listen, I am in a position now. I've had a wonderful, intense, cool career. I've done, I've done so many things. I've been so many places. I have a beautiful wife. I have wonderful kids wonderful home, wonderful family. I said, none of that, none of that would exist right now had I uttered the two words that you all have never, have not uttered. And those words were, I quit. If I had said I quit, my whole life would have been different, right? And I said to them, I said, listen, you, you did not utter those words, which means you are on the precipice of greatness, of a great experience, a great life, because you didn't utter those words, okay? And the reason why I tell you that story is because I really think about People ask me, if you could go back and say something to your young self, what it would be. And I wouldn't say anything. <laughs> I wouldn't. <laughs> I'd love to observe. I'd love to observe. But I'd be so afraid that I would influence myself to do something different. And that wouldn't get me to where I am today, right? Because again, it's the butterfly effect. You know, one decision this way or that way can change the trajectory of your own entire life, right? So I really look back. There are some mistakes I made. There are some bad times, good times. And I honor every one of them. I recognize every single one of their value and necessity in my current pathway. And so the dodge of the question is I wouldn't say anything. If I don't want to dodge the question, I'd say, well, work on your self-discipline. That'd probably help you out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, it's a very, very fair answer. It gives me reason to reflect because all of my experiences bring me to this moment. That's right. And one of those one way or the other would have twisted. Well, Rich, this has just been 
an engaging conversation. I hope you do add those thousand pages at one time. Well, I absolutely <laughs> will read them and I look forward to what we're creating together. Truly an honor. I can say, you know, proudly that my life is better and more enriched because we've crossed paths. Things have bring you to a certain point, but I thank you for being on the Talent War podcast. And I guess I'm going to see you next Wednesday on the book call, right? We shall, my friend. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we'll talk here in a few days. Thanks, George. Have a great weekend. You too. Bye. And thank you for listening to the Talent War podcast, where we discuss all things talent, focusing on a true talent mindset which is a core belief that the only true competitive advantage you can hope to achieve and maintain is your talent. Join us for the next episode of the Talent War podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you like what you heard, subscribe. Please leave a review and connect with Dr. Tom Lokar and myself on Talent War Group's LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram accounts and send your comments and inquiries to media at Talent War Group. The Talent War podcast is brought to you by the Talent War Group, a management consulting and executive search firm. With services like talent acquisition, leadership development, seminars, and executive coaching, we will work with you to create talent solutions to your business problems. To get started, please visit us at www.talentwargroup.com.